Welcome to episode number 162 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and before we start, I just have to give a shout out to Livestream, who is our video streaming partner, because they are great and they are enterprise ready and stable, which is what we need at CXO Talk. And Livestream, you guys are great partners, and, and I just want to thank you. We're here today talking with somebody who is one of the top angel investors in the world, and at the same time is truly a pioneer in new media, Jason Calacanis. Jason, how are you today? I'm very good. I am I'm super, super excited uh, to be here, and I am 12 days away from uh, my wife's due date for twins, so if I get a phone call during this, I might be leaving because she's going into labor. Who knows? Anything can happen. Well, thanks. Hey, thank you for taking the time to do this, especially under those circumstances. Jason, very briefly, tell us about your background, just to very quickly set some context. Well, I'm a kid from Brooklyn who grew up in the right time in history, I guess, in terms of opportunity, because, uh, you know, in 1977, 78, somewhere in that time frame, I started using a computer, a TR, TSR-80, I think, when I was uh, out in New Jersey at my cousin Eddie and Billy's house. We would go to computer camp, and boy, was that a revelation to me when we were programming BASIC. And then I got my own IBM PC Junior and had an Atari 2600, and so I was kind of born at the beginning of this personal computer era and uh, was fascinated by it, was able to get high paying jobs my whole career as a database programmer, a developer, uh, doing PC maintenance. I, I, somebody just found, my brother actually found my business card for my first real full-time job, which was working for Amnesty International. And it said on the card, microcomputer specialist. And uh, I was so proud of that card because I was a specialist at something in my life. And um, but I quickly realized I didn't want to work for anybody, and I started doing more and more entrepreneurial projects, let's call them. And once I had that entrepreneurial bug, um, I had started a magazine called Cyber Surfer with a publisher that ended badly. I did five episodes, five issues of that. Then I started Silicon Valley Reporter, which became my first big claim to fame. Um, I grew that to a $12 million a year business off my credit cards. And... It was um, quite a run. You know, we had, I think, uh, maybe 75 or 100 employees at the peak. And I was a 26, 27, 28-year-old with, you know, whatever, almost 100 people working for me and sitting around a table with 25 journalists. So it was uh, pretty heady stuff. And then, of course, the market crashed. I sold that company to Dow Jones. I got a couple of years' salary. Started Web Blogs Inc., which was a blogging company when there really were only two or three other blogs out there. Dave Weiner had a blog. And um, Gawker was out. Gizmodo had just launched. And then I started Engadget Autoblog Joystick and a bunch of other blogs. 18 months after Mark Cuban invested and we started that company, I sold it for $3 million to AOL. And uh, then I worked at Sequoia as an entrepreneur in residence, did, some, uh, did another company right. called Mahalo, which is now inside and still chugging along. And uh, along the way, about five or six years ago, my friends at Sequoia said, Jason, do you ever think about doing angel investing? You know a lot of people, um, and you forward us a bunch of your friends to look at their companies. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? Uh, and I said, okay, yeah, I'll try it. And so, you know, my first five investments were things like Thumbtack, Uber, Chartbeat, and Signpost. So I had quite a nose for what is a good company and a really good network. And since that time, I've done 150 companies in just under six years. I'm on pace to do about 40 investments a year. And I'm definitely the most prolific and arguably, you know, depending on who you ask, the number one, two, three, four, or five most desired angel investors in the world, which is kind of how I define mm -hmm. success as an angel investor, which is how much right. do the founders want you in their company. And, uh, you know, when Y Combinator bans you, you know you're doing something right. Right. So... Let's. Uh, so, what are the on these these angel investments that you're doing? Is there a particular common theme? Yes, I pick entrepreneurs who are extremely driven, resilient, 
and want to and who want to win. Then I pick entrepreneurs who are executing at a very high level. And then I pick entrepreneurs who fit those two categories who are operating hopefully in a space that I can see becoming a billion dollar uh, market cap company. So I can't figure out how to get to a billion dollar market cap company. And those other two factors are very strong, the resiliency and drive of the founder and the founder's ability to execute, I might still invest. But if those first two are off, I will not invest. So there's, there's no particular domain, subject domain or topic domain, so to speak, that you're no. investing in. Uh -huh. No, that's stupid um, to do, I, I think. I think people who are like, like, these are my things, I think that's kind of stupid. Uh, all due respect to people who do this and there are people who build entire funds or they, it might be because they love working on those projects or they're intellectually curious about it. I don't think it's a very good thesis for returns because it presupposes that you are some genius with Nostradamus like effects. And I haven't met the person who has that. And that's coming from the person who is in the top 10 angel investors of all time right now. So, you know, uh, I, I've watched the other angel investors who've done an amazing job, better job than me, Ron Conway, Chris Saka. They've, they've had much more success than I've had so far. And um, Mark Andreessen, even uh, when he was an angel investor, did pretty well too. Kevin Rose did fabulous. Um, I think all those people have much better track records than I do, um, although none of them are angel investing anymore. But those four, um, I don't think that they were sector specific either. Mm -hmm. So, Right. You know, if you just look at the statistics, this idea that like the Google Glass Fund, which, you know, Mark and Teresa and a bunch of people did the Google Glass Fund. Now there's a Slack Fund. There previously have been, you know, Well, they're, they're, they're serving a particular interest in those cases. Yeah, it's I think a particular it's a huge master. Mistake. Yeah, it's a huge mistake, whether it's for a particular, I mean, I understand why the, it's not a mistake for the company. Slack or Google, it's probably a great idea to put $100 million into funds to build up their core business. It's a mistake for everybody else. Uh, it's a mistake for fund managers, I think, to be sector specific. Um, you could have preferences. Like, you know, listen, if you're a PhD in biology and, you know, whatever, yeah, sure, focus on biology. I understand that. But I think on the angel investing front, if you're looking for the big binary outcomes, I would have never been, you know, a marketplace investor or a taxi cab investor. My two top investments are a transportation company and a marketplace company. I, I didn't ever think I was going to be in those businesses, right? And now I'm, I think my, my biggest company after Uber or Thumbtack is probably going to wind up being Cafe X, which is a robotic coffee machine. So I never thought I'd be in the coffee business either. Uh, but here, here we are, right? So I, don't, I try to reserve judgment. And what I learned long ago is that I'm not the smartest kid in the class. They told me that explicitly, actually. <laughs> you are not the smartest kid in the class. So then I said, hey, if I'm not the smartest kid in the class, I can be the hardest working. And I can be the most connected. I can be the most risk-taking. And so the smart kids are sitting on the bench and I'm more aggressive and risk-taking than they are. What about uh, media? You, are, you have This Week in Startup and you're, you've hit over 600 episodes. Yeah. So tell us about... It's a hobby. So it's a hobby. So you're doing this thing as a hobby and you've got 600 episodes under your belt, but you tell us about that and tell us about what's going on in media because you've got a unique position and unique seat as a media yeah observer. it's the number one startup podcast i think in the world um well, well actually no there's another group that kind of did a podcast called startup that's about their, their startup and they're much npr guys i think they have much more traffic than i do um but i think i think um uh, in terms of like a serious startup you know not like an entertainment show we are the beginning and the end of it. Um, and we have, um, like I think, close to a million dollars in revenue or so uh, on the podcast. And, you know, we've got an Emmy Award winning producer and, you know, a bunch of people who work on it. So I love doing it, but I actually do it to feed my own intellectual curiosity because I like having conversations with intelligent people. And after I get out of those conversations, I feel more inspired and I have more energy. So I'm a high extrovert and one of the definitions of an introvert versus an extrovert is where they get their energy from. I learned a long time ago, if I have a great conversation, you know, at noon, you know, for the next 24 hours, my energy is really high. My creativity is very high and I'm really enthused. So my, my podcast is almost in a way 
like my energy. I just asked my producer to get me highly intelligent people that I can talk to. I could do it all day long. I could interview three people a day, every day for 365 days a year. And that would not feel like work to me. Yeah. I mean, I interview people like you, people shaping the world and it's so much fun, but you have a million dollars in revenue. What is the business model then? We read two ads a day, uh, two ads per episode. And um, we limit the advertisers to people who are have products that I actually use or one of my companies uses. So we don't get any sort of shitty advertisers or advertisers we don't believe in. You know, like I use GoToMeeting, I use Squarespace, we use PagerDuty, we use Chartbeat. Like, uh, oh, actually, Chartbeat's not an advertiser. Um, you know, just when we had Mailchimp as an advertiser, we used Mailchimp. I still use Mailchimp. Audible, I love Audible knows I love them because I tweet about what books I like. Then they came in as an advertiser. Then they went away for two years and they came back. You know, like just different companies I love, their products will just float in and out and support the podcast. We typically sell out the ads three, four, five months in advance. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a nice little business that I enjoy doing. Um, I don't know if I'll get past it. You know, I think I, maybe I'll get to a thousand episodes and maybe I'll pack it in. I don't know. I said that when we were getting close to 500, when I was at three or 400, I was like, hmm, I don't know, maybe, I, maybe I'll stop doing this at some point. But we'll see. I've gotten a lot of offers to do stuff, you know, on real television now and, you know, real radio. And so, I, you know, I've considered some of those opportunities. I'd like to expand, you know, a little bit beyond technology and maybe talk about some things just a little bit outside of that. Because um, I talk about entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and technology. And, we, you know, that leads into a lot of other areas, but, you know, part of me would like in another life to just host a drive time radio show for three hours a day. I kind of love doing that. Yeah. You like, you like to uh, chit chat. That's not quite the right term. Uh, How do you build the audience? Because I think that's the real question that everybody has. So, so how do you build the the question you have? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Let's be honest. It's definitely the question that I have, but I think we're the quality of the guests. That's it. It begins and ends with the quality of the guests. You Uh get a a great guest. You have a great conversation. The the thing's going to grow. And the other thing is to just show up, you know, like people do like five episodes and it's their, them and their friends talking and it's incredibly boring and, None of them have any type of demonstrable success or charisma and, or they're entertaining, but they just do a bad impersonation of some other podcaster or, or other po- personality. And what they don't realize is, you know, it's not about you frequently. It's, you know, the best podcast are about the guests, you know, like, like Kevin Pollack or Mark Marin or Corolla, you know, some of those people, you know, are actors and comedians outside of it. But in those three cases, they all happen to be just exceptionally good at, interviewing and having conversations. So, you know, I think if you look at Bill Simmons, you know, he's just a really great ringleader or Leo Laporte. So I think there's like different categories. There's people who are the ringleaders, like a Leo Laporte or Bill Simmons, and they can sort of organize a group of talented people around a topic. And then you have people who are solo artists and then you have people who are great interviewers. You know, there's all different types uh, of people out there who have different skill sets, and you have to figure out which one is yours. And for me, you know, I'm always trying to increase the quality of the guest. I know I'm a great interviewer, but, you know, I don't know if I would be a great solo podcaster, like just me talking. I don't know if anybody would give a shit. Yeah, no, it definitely helps. I mean, you need to have something to to bounce off on. Um, so a lot of it is being relentless. Yeah, showing up is probably 90% of it. Um, and you, you could probably say relentless is, you know, a way of saying showing up. But I do have to say, like, you know, um, showing up and it being bad forever is not good either. But if you show up, you should listen to what you've done or take notes or listen to the audience and just try to make it a little bit better each time. I mean, after 600 episodes, if I made it just 1% better each time, you know, that means it's going to be well more than 6x, right? Because you have a compounding effect there. I mean, 10x or whatever. So I should be, theoretically, if I got 1% better every episode, you know, 10 times better, whatever it is. So we can do the math. But, um, you know, I don't think a lot of people are super considered, nor do I think people are relentless. So 
uh, you know, I think it takes a certain type of person because, you know, it's, it's going to suck for the first two or three years in terms of revenue or audience. Um, so I think the people who succeed are the people who make it to year three or four. I think years one or two, you just kind of get your legs under you. Unless, of course, you're Adam Carolla and you did a radio show or you're Joe Rogan and, you know, but even Joe Rogan is up to 700 episodes. I think he does it every day. So he's just plowing through episodes and he, um, you know, he's pretty dynamic uh, uh, in terms of as an individual. So, you know, there are exceptions to it, but generally speaking, there's no exception that hard work pays off. Well, this is as you and I met at Jason Lemkin's Saster conference a few weeks ago. At the opening night party. At yes. the, that's right. At the opening night party. And I told you how many episodes we had done and you nailed it. You nailed the, so, so for us, it's, uh, it's about three years now. But as far as measuring- And you have good cameras. Uh, oh, we got a great camera. Got a great camera. <laughs> camera looks good. I Googled it. This, uh, this camera, there, there aren't many people who are using this type of camera as a webcam. And it took a lot of work to figure it out. But you know, figured it out. So as far as metrics goes, everybody is hung up on page views. And with there's problems with page views in general, but with video, it doesn't consider engagement at all, nor does it consider the quality of the audience. So how do you, how do you, um, how do you think about metrics, page views, and evaluating success? I don't, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I, everything for me begins and ends with just having a great conversation. You know, if, and there are, there are all kinds of little tips and tricks and growth things you can do. Um, I suppose having good cover art um, is uh, good. Apple featuring you is good. Having an email list is great. So, you know, I'm gonna just even basic stuff like that. That's like, I guess, blocking and tackling. But again, if you get a great guest and uh, you know, everything sort of flows from there. And if you get the best out of that great guest. So if you look at like somebody like Chris Sock or Chamath, a lot of people had them as guests, but nobody got out of them what I got out of those individuals in conversation because they feel comfortable with me. And that's my great advantage as an interviewer is that a lot of the people I'm interviewing, if a journalist was interviewing them, they would look at it as a journalist, which means it's going to be pretty antagonistic um, by definition. And if they look at it at me, they go, oh, this is a guy who I do deals with. Or this is the person I play poker with, or this is the person who I went on vacation with, or this is the person who I had dinner with, or this is the person that we had a play date with our kids. So I'm just at this incredible, you know, massive unfair advantage versus journalists who, when they come in, they don't really know who the person is. And so I'm not trying to catch anybody or do a gotcha journalism type thing. I'm just having a real conversation. Now, sometimes I have a real conversation with somebody and somebody will go there and I'll be like, whoa, did they mean to go there or not? Like the last Chamath episode, he just went diversity, diversity. Now I asked him about diversity because he had put it out there by writing this blog post and doing this study with the information about it. So I sort of just put it out on a plate and said, hey, tell me about your diversity efforts. I didn't ask him some, you know, really, you know, challenging Mike Wallace, you know, hard hitting 60 right. minutes it's confrontational question. But I don't need to because the person, you know, if the person trusts me, if the person feels comfortable with me, I can start on second or third base in terms of you know get, hit, getting that home run answer. Um, so there's an intimacy. There's an so you're able to so the the key to your interviewing then is creating a, a an intimacy that's based on uh, trust, shared shared background. They trust you basically. Well, yeah, I'm friends with a lot of people who are on the show and a lot of the people who you know have listened to the show for years or they've known me for 20 years as a journalist, as an angel investor, as an entrepreneur. So I do think you, you accrue a certain amount of, you know, respect or people in some cases even have reverence for you. You know, I had people like Ryan from product hunt on the show and he's like, I listened to this during college. Like I called into the show or, you know, the, one of the founders of DigitalOcean is like, I'm at DigitalOcean because you told me to quit my job and go join DigitalOcean. I, I was on an Ask Jason segment and I was like, you were? I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I do remember that. Like, So this, you know, I think when you're stuck around for long enough, um, and I think, like, if you listen to Howard Stern in his last five, six years, he's become this incredible interviewer. I would argue he's always been a really good interviewer. But over the last five or six years, people coming into it, you know, hey, this guy's retiring. I've, this guy's made me laugh for 20 years or 30 years. 
this guy has had great conversations with other people. I think people are now going in there. He just had Sally Field on. You know, it's like, I don't know if Sally Field would ever have been on the show 10, 20, 30 years ago, but after she hears Gwen Stefani, or I'm sorry, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was another incredible interview, or Madonna, or other people come on and give a great interview, I think it kind of, somebody sends that person the tape and says, listen to these three interviews, and they get inspired, they trust the person, they have reverence for them, they respect them, whatever it is. Um, I think I'm sort of just starting to tip into that in my career, which is people go, oh yeah, this guy's like, um, I've laughed at a show before. I got information out of a show before. I can't wait to be on the show. For, I have many people after the, we walk out of the show, they're like, this show inspired me to be an entrepreneur or, you know, this interview with this entrepreneur inspired me. So this person you had on as a guest inspired me to be an entrepreneur. I just happened to be in the room for it. So, you know, it's um, the power of podcasting is not to be underestimated. So what are the, so we're, so you've got a, you, you've got your This Week in Startups that you then, convert to a podcast. Are there business models for podcasters these days? Well, advertising is the obviously one and donations work pretty well too. So if you look at um, Tech News Today, it's called Tech News Today. Yeah, the guy who worked with, um, previously worked with Leo, who did his daily tech show, uh, Tom Merritt, he left and did his own show. He's on Patreon. He might do 10, 15, 20K a month in reoccurring donations. If he's up to 20K a month, it's $240,000 a year. He does it out of his house. They're doing it on Google Hangouts, is you know, close to zero cost um, or very minimal cost, a producer and some bandwidth, whatever, 100K a year, 200K a year. So I think there are models out there between, you know, asking the audience to pay and asking uh, sponsors to pay, but I don't think it's a place to go to get rich at all. Uh, and there's also getting speaking gigs. I was talking to somebody you know, who has a podcast, I won't say the name, but was telling me like, yeah, I just got my first 10, 20 K speaking gigs and I'm getting those every month. So it's like, okay, your podcast makes zero, but you got two speaking gigs a month. You make 30 K a month from speaking gigs. Holy shit. What a life you have now. So, I mean, if I wasn't doing everything else I could do or doing right now, I could literally just do speaking gigs for 20 grand or something or 10 grand or I don't know what people would pay me now. I haven't done it in years, but I could just do the speaking circuit probably like Seth Godin does or other people. And you know, pay the mortgage that way. So there's plenty of opportunities, but I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a, a great business to get into as a business. I was talking with the editor, editor in chief recently of a major news site, and his observation is media these days is a is kind of a cottage business because so it's sort of mirroring. It's a lot of cottages. There's a lot of cottages, and but but there aren't too many big houses. I mean, it's almost impossible to build a huge, a, a major media yeah, company. Yeah, I mean, you have to think about that. So yeah, who, I mean, who cares about building a major media company? If you're Howard Stern, um, you know, and you can leave Terrestrial and go from 30 million listeners or 20, 30 million at his peak, go down to two or 3 million, at, you know, now or 5 million, whatever he gets, you know, well, he's making more money with 10% of the audience because that audience is paying, uh, you know, 10, 15 bucks a month. If you look at someone like Leo Laporte, yeah, sure, he could get a million dollar a year contract with somebody or he could make, I don't know, I guess a million dollars or $2 million in profit a year uh, doing his own network, having his own building, having his own team and not answering to somebody. So Adam Carolla was on regular radio. Now he makes $5 million a year or $4 million a year doing what he does. So, you know, it's all trade-offs, but I think it's, it's really bad for the big media companies because, um, you know, they, they can't control the best talent anymore. The talent can go direct to the audience. And so everybody who wants to create a podcasting network, like I tried to do it, and I had the same experience with every talented person, which was they would go in and out of wanting to do a podcast or not because they don't need to. And they don't need anybody. So they're like, hey, you can rep my ads, but I don't need to be part of a network. I don't need to get a paycheck from you. I'm not doing it for the paycheck. So I think that there is a um, there are some complications to making it a big scalable, you know, there's a, there's a podcast one network. There's a, you know, people are making their own little networks like Leo Laporte did like I did, like other people did. And, you know, it's, you know, I, I think it's very hard to get that second, third, fourth, fifth hit podcast that you own because you don't own the talent. I mean, anybody can just leave. And I think Tom Merritt had a year or two with Leo and then now he's on his own. So I think that's, and that's not no fault to Leo. It's just the nature of the business. If somebody can just walk out the door and start their podcast the next day, set up a Patreon page and technology allows them to go do it themselves. What about, Education. So you're talking about podcasts where the personality 
of the interviewer is so strong that it really carries it. But what about uh, distributed education and approaching it that way, looking at it as an educational vehicle rather than yeah, just- Yeah, I mean, that. listen, people get an education from it for sure. I think in that way, you know, Audible has been doing better and better. So as podcasting does better, Audible does better, Audible does better, podcasting does better. I think people are looking at the spoken word and, you know, just, you know, this device changes everything because I have a computer in my pocket with broadband, essentially. So, and unlimited storage, essentially. So, um, you know, I don't know how many podcasts you can fit on one of these things, but more than you can listen to in a year. So, um, yeah, the software is sophisticated. The amount of content out there is unbelievable. The quality of it is, you know, variable, but at the top end, it's, it's exceptional. So, it's, um, yeah, education is a great category. Again, uh, it's probably other tools that are better for education, like directly teaching people than podcasts. So what Coursera is doing with nano courses or Daily Drip is doing with daily education or Linda and Treehouse with continuing education, like those things are better or Duolingo for, you know, learning a language. So there are going to be very specific vertical, they're going to be vertical specific apps and platforms that will do better in education. But for generalized, keeping up with the news, keeping up with industry information and learning just how the industry works, there is nothing better, yeah. I mean, if, if you could have a choice to go get an MBA or take the 200,000 you spent with the MBA and literally listen to three or four podcasts a day and write a blog post about them and pay your living expenses and do that for three years, I think you would learn more actually doing two, or two years of listening to podcasts and writing up a blog post on them and writing your notes about them and then doing your own each weekly podcast. Yeah, for sure. You could roll your own education, but you'd have to have discipline. It's easier to give another person a bunch of money and let them have the discipline. Jason, we have a question from Arsalan Khan who's asking, what's the best way to promote your material? But there's another way of asking it as well, which is with so much content that's out there, how do you break through the noise? And you've done an incredible job with that. So teach us, how do you break through the noise? Um, it's a good question. I think the quality and having a vertical that you're good in is a good starting point. So, you know, if you start, you know, you started CXO podcast, right? Like it's a very general thing, but at least it's about the senior executives at a company, like doing the CFO podcast or the CTO podcast or the chief strategy officer podcast would be a much better way to start than just doing like that CXO not that CXO is a bad way to start. It's obviously worked to a certain extent for you. So that's awesome. But I would say go even more niche. You know, um, I didn't do this week in tech. Leo did that. I did this week in startups, a subsection of technology in the subsection that I happen to be an expert on or, you know, most people would consider me an expert on. So the key is to focus. Well, I mean, if you created a sports podcast right now, I don't know that anybody gives a shit, but if you created one about, you know, rock climbing, you might not have as much competition. I tell everybody we're the number one startup podcast because there were no other podcasts about startups. You know, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty true. When you don't have competition, it's easy to be number one. Now, switching back to investing, you are seeing so many different companies. What's interesting? What's interesting that's coming down the pike that you observe? Uh, robotics, marketplaces, AI, machine learning, um, you know, enterprise software, you know, there's always a place for people having tools that make them even more bionic. So I'm seeing a lot of uh, tools that make individuals more effective at what they do because let's face it, the, you know, the machines are going to start doing really interesting things that white collar people do right now. So, you know, first we had, you know, machines that just drove stuff instead of people carrying it. You know, now we have machines that lift things. People used to lift things. Now we have people putting, painting cars, putting the doors on the cars, putting the hoods on the cars. You know, it's only a matter of time before the cars, you know, start driving themselves. So, you know, just the idea of well, manual labor is going away. And then the next piece that's going away is a white collar work. And even some of the sophisticated white collar work will start going away. So this idea, you know, that somebody would connect your phone call, obviously, receptionists went away and now you have oh you had an executive assistant who booked meetings well now there's this like you know a, a virtual assistant you can cc on your emails and uh, he or she depending on how you want i just to name started using that 
Yeah, it just it's you know it basically books the meeting for you, um, and there's a little bit of human interaction on the back end, but it just works, right? And so you're going to start seeing a lot more of that, and that's going to go faster than people think. So this making people bionic is something I'm getting a little bit interested in. So I think what will happen is just that you know my company launch we did the launch festival again, and it's like the eighth or ninth year we're doing it. It's bigger than ever with less people working on it. So we reduce the number of people working on it. The people who work on it are getting better and better. So we use something like Zapier, Typeform, Stripe, Squarespace, and HipChat in combination with Google Docs to just solve so many problems. So we had Typeform for registration. Then we were doing outreach.io to upsell people on different types of ticket and do sales automation or ticket set automation. When tickets got bought, they was putting into the hip chat room that the ticket had been bought. Um, Stripe was processing it. So we're creating like all these like little scripts and if then else statements. It's not quite programming, but sort of scripting. And, you know, it's going to turn out that we're going to be able to say we're having an event on this date and we just put it all in wonder list, like all the things that have to be done and the launch angel summit, which is our next event we're going to do this summer. It, it's like we popped up the event in almost no time. And the only piece that's taking time is going to be not even inviting people. The thing that will take time is getting uh, a location. And after we have the location, uh, getting everything else in line is going to be really easy. So we're pretty excited about that. So you're using all of these different apps as essentially you're, you're weaving to weaving them together in in one chain in effect to replace having to buy some yeah. sort of large enterprise app oh no having to throw people at it. really i mean it, it really was like a more manual process so we just we you know this sort of business process uh, outsourcing used to occur now it's just business process scripting where you just script this is what i want to occur in a business process somebody applies for a ticket it knows they're an angel investor, you know, it, you know, um, alert somebody on our team. We check if they're a member of our syndicate. We, we could do all this kind of like interesting, you know, if then else kind of things, you know, put them into the spreadsheet, have the third party printing company, print them a badge, like all the stuff that we used to take a lot of time to do is just getting easier and easier. And so the data is, and you're using Zapier to basically manage the flow. Yeah. Zapier. Things. And if, if it, if this, then that, mm -hmm. you know, the, both of those programs work really well together. And Typeform is this great, you know, forms company. It's sort of like SurveyMonkey, but a little sexier. Um, and SurveyMonkey does good stuff too. You know, you can just kind of like weave all these products together as glue is built between them through APIs. So I think there's going to be some big opportunities there, but I do think that employment is um, going to be really interesting to see how we create new jobs. And, you know, if we replace we can train people up fast enough because, you know, you have people out there who don't even know how to use email properly or don't even know how to use, you know, document management or spreadsheets and they can't spell and they don't know grammar and they don't know how to do formulas. And then you have this other group of people who know all that stuff and now they're learning how to glue it all together. It's like, you know, I frequently hear people say like, well, I could hire somebody for that, but I'll, I'll just write a script to do it. Right. It's like, Oh, Really, so the twenty dollar an hour jobs, the thirty dollar an hour jobs are going away, and you basically have this hundred thousand dollar person or seventy five thousand dollar person in an organization who does the work of five or six people, um, and that's you know that's the efficiency that's driving the economy. Will it? You know, and, and we're seeing more and more people join the permanent unemployed. So I think what you'll have in society is there'll be less and less people full time employed, supporting more and more people who are not employed. Um, I don't know if that would be through government or through families or communities, but it's definitely going to be a trend. There's something, something's in the air. So the weaving together, this is, it's so interesting. So the weaving together requires an understanding of a range of products that are out there in order to- And the ability to learn new products. So you have to learn how to be able to know how to use new products. And who, so on your team, who do you have that is helping architect? In a way, this is like the new enterprise architecture. Is yeah, you just have to have bright people who are fearless. I mean, I think they have to have high IQs, you know, they have to literally be smart. Like if they were going to play chess, they would be in the top 20% of chess players. So, you know, the, it could be that they apply themselves. It could be that they've applied themselves previously. I, you know, I don't want to get too much into judgments about nature versus nurture, but Essentially, if you're able to learn new software quickly uh, and you're smart and hardworking, you can just start 
using these tools. And you also know to look for tools. So I have people who are just so, uh, I see people in the world. I don't have them working for me. I fire them real quick or my team spits them out pretty quick. But, you know, there are people who are like, I don't know how to do that. And it's just like, let me Google that for you. You know, ticket sales, you know, like, you know, ever, you know, we were using Eventbrite, right? Eventbrite competitors. So like, we just found people who wrote blog posts. Like if you don't want to pay Eventbrite, whatever they charge 5% for ticket sales, you can literally set up a type form, put in Stripe and build your own Eventbrite. Like it used to be just five, six, seven years ago, Eventbrite was this incredibly revolutionary product and we used it, other people used it. And I was like, why am I paying them for? And it's like, well, because they do all the processing and all that stuff. It's like, yeah, but Stripe does that and we have a Stripe account. And you can plug your Stripe account into type form and ask for the first name, last name and these other five questions and you've got something better than Eventbrite. So, you know, it's um, it's pretty interesting times. You can basically roll your own stuff, and it, it's uh, more effective and cheaper and better. Yeah, it's pretty. It is pretty amazing. Um, so, so again, the, the the challenge in a sense is understanding the the range of products, understanding the capabilities of the products, because that's the first step to being able to do what you just what, what you were just describing. Um. I, you know, I'm not sure exactly where this is going. Um, I, one of the things I've learned as an angel investor is I don't actually have to know where the, you know, where the train is going or the rocket ship's going. I just have to be able to identify this as a rocket ship. This is a train. Get on it. <laughs> right. So I know there's a train. It's going somewhere. There's a rocket ship. It's going somewhere. I just need to be on it. And by on it, it means I need to be on the cap table somehow. What's the best way for uh, people who want to be funded to approach you? How do you like to be approached? Oh, it's not so much about how I like to be approached. I could tell you the most effective way to get to any investor. Um, Cause I'm not like one of these guys who's like, you know, the queen of England. Like I literally have some VC friends who are like, this is how you have to approach me. You have to ask for, you know, da, 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 and then I want to see this and I want to da, da, da. It's just like, get over yourself. Um, you know, basically I could tell you the best hack is to have, coffee with an entrepreneur who's in that person's portfolio, have that entrepreneur fall in love with your business and have them introduce you. So if you want to get Bill Gurley as an investor and somebody from, you know, one of his portfolio companies, whether it's dog vacay or Uber or anywhere in between, like that's the way he's going to pay attention. If you get want me and you talk to Marco at Thumbtack, or you talk to Tony at Chartbeat, or you talk to you know Stuart Signpost, any of those people, um, you know, and they refer you to me and say, "Hey, Jason, this looks really interesting to me." That's the best way. Um, cold emails we look at, and if it's an incredible product that has revenue traction and is really well put together, sure. And then the worst things you can do is to say, "Can I have coffee and write a long email?" Um, it's like, well, this is too long. So it's kind of like, oh my God, like, I, I, what's important in a 2000 word email? It's very hard to determine. So I like short emails. We are building a Slack competitor that is better because it's open source and we're going to make money off hosting and we charge a flat rate of $500 a month and you can have as many people as you want. It's very disruptive. Like that email to me would be like, okay. And there's a link. You can see the product here. You can try the product here we have 20 people who are using it, whatever, you know, like the way I just presented that, like, yeah, we're a flat rate version of uh, Slack. It's like, oh, Slack charges per seat. You charge just 500 bucks a month. You have unlimited. Okay. That sounds like it's going to disrupt their business model. Great. Let's talk. Right. So, you know, people are just a little bit clueless. They want to hang out. They think that like, they've got it backwards. They think that if you're associated with a great entrepreneur, a great investor, you're going to be successful. What it is, is the great investors are finding the great entrepreneurs and it, makes them look successful. You know, I'm not, the fact that I'm an investor in Uber makes me seem like I'm the most brilliant person on the planet. I can assure you I am not. I got lucky, had a 20, 15 year relationship with the founder of the company and we're friends and I got lucky. And if anybody wants to ascribe anything that Uber has done to me, they're idiots. Like Uber would have been as successful, I have absolutely no credit to take from it. And then, you know, it, it pisses me off a little bit sometimes because I'll see other investors in Uber um, or Thumbtack and they want to all like take credit for it. The most you can take credit for, I think as an investor, is, you know, being a good picker, right? I mean, and then you can take a little bit of, 
you know, you can give yourself a high five or a pat on the back if you like, if the founders say you've been helpful when they needed somebody to talk to or a connection. But the truth is the entrepreneur, because I'm an entrepreneur, you know, like I know the truth is the entrepreneurs build these businesses, the investors, they might help guide them. They may help set up meetings. They may help with a hire, but they're not in there every day working 12 hours a day, like everybody else on the team. So, you know, never get too high on your own supply. Even the, you know, like it's, it's, it's ironic, uh, or it's actually say it's paradoxical that the best, on, the best investors in the world are always the most humble and aware of this fact. Like you would never see Bill Gurley, you know, and the benchmark team taking credit for, you know, their investments, success. You would never see Sequoia doing that. You would never see social capital doing that. We all know, like, we pick great entrepreneurs. We support the hell out of them, but they, they're doing the heavy lifting. I had, the, uh, I had uh, Lou Cern, who is the CEO of New Relic, on CXO Talk, and he made the comment that the best entrepreneurs are the ones who are the most self-aware. Um, yeah, I... You do need to be a little bit self-aware. I mean, I've seen people who are not self-aware to be successful too. They're just being delusional and whatever. But yeah, I would say being self-aware is a gift um, because you know your own psychology. You know what's going on inside your head. You know why you're doing stuff. You know your motivation. It takes a little while to get there typically um, for most entrepreneurs because if you start stuff when you're young, what do you know? Um, but you know, when you get older, it's pretty nice to be self-aware. It can also be a curse to be self-aware because – you realize it's all meaningless and you're going to die. And what is the point of having the number one enterprise software company? So be pretty careful because if you become super enlightened, you might just realize like, oh my God, I could just take whatever money I have right now and live on a beach and spend time with my kids, which is much more important and fun for me, you know, or I could just go play cards for a living and laugh and sleep and eat and not really have to have any of the stress. So, yeah. So we're just about out of time. Okay. So why don't you pitch us anything you want that you're working on? Oh, well, I would say check out the inside uh, daily briefing. I'm particularly proud of that and the launch ticker. They're both the exact same media product in two different verticals. Essentially, I have writers who are really smart, read all the news all day and summarize it and curate it and send it to you. Um, inside daily briefing goes to 20,000 people, 50% of them open every email. Uh, and there's two emails a day. So we're getting, you know, probably, I would say 75% of the list, 80% of the list opens either of the two emails a, a day. And every week, probably 80% of them open it. Um, so it is incredibly time time saving. It's time consuming on our part to have a full time editor and a half going through all this content and saying these are the best and debating that and actually putting it to work um, and determining what is the best based on people's clicks and what you read in the newspaper. So inside.com, just go there and sign up, try it for 10 days and then hit reply. Uh, and it will go to the entire team and rate the email on a scale of one to 10 and people do it. So like I'll ask people every, you know, 50 episodes or so every three or four weeks. I'm just like, Hey, rate the email one to 10 and tell us what you love and don't. And people write back like this thing saves me so much time. It's incredible. So I think it's going to be a very big business. I have 20,000 people in the email now. I think I might be able to get it to a million. Um, so if I get it to a million people a day, getting it twice a day, my own, that could be a huge business. And launch ticker is $100 a year, $10 a month, and it's the same product. And about 11,000, 10,000 or 11,000 people get it every day. And we've converted 1,000 of them to paid. Those other 9,000 are on a one-year free trial or two-month free trial, whatever it is, uh, depending on when we put them on the list. So those are the two things I think are super fascinating in my world. And I could use feedback on. And your, uh, your, your open rates are phenomenal. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's like five, ten times the industry average because we have a secret. If you send it twice a day and people don't want it, they unsubscribe. And then we put an unsubscribe link at the top sometimes. And we're like, hey, if you don't, if you don't want, because no, people don't page down to the bottom. So I'll just say, hey, if you're not enjoying this anymore, do me a favor, please unsubscribe. And then people hit reply, like, why are you asking me to subscribe? I'm like, well, because if you don't want to be on it, I don't want you to get it. And because I want to be able to have the high open rates, right, and have the high click rates, because that, you know, really helps. Um, and then some people are like, you know, I don't click because you summarize the news so eloquently. I don't need to. Now I got to figure out what the business model is here. So that's the next piece of the puzzle. But just go to inside.com, try it, hit reply. I get every reply, and I reply to probably nine out of ten. Uh, almost always I reply. Um, and just give me your critical feedback. Give me what you love. Rate it on a scale of one to 10. 
Great. Well, thank you so much. And I also, before we go, have to give a shout out to Marshall Kirkpatrick, who's sure, the, good guy. who's the founder of Little Bird, which is a great yeah. social media person uh, platform, uh, influencer discovery, I really should say, and I'm an investor. And he's Marshall's the person who who introduced us, and we just we released the uh, twenty influential. CXO Talk Guide to 20 Influential Chief Digital Officers and Chief Information Officers, and we use Little Bird. So thank you to Marshall Kirkpatrick. And thank you to Jason Kalkanis, who has been our guest today on episode number 162 of CXOTalk.com. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And Congratulations on your upcoming twins. Absolutely. It's going to be amazing. Everybody, thanks so much, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.